Oh, three, two, one. There we go. Where we're going. Welcome to Intelligent Disclosure. I'm Richard Olin with my wife, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Hi. Just, just <laughs> raced in, got everything ready, the notes, the whole thing. So now we're here. That's right. And we see the chat family out there already. Good to see you guys. I want to say hi to everyone. So uh, I'm very excited about the uh, theme we're going to be talking about tonight. Me too. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we did the whole crazy French wave of humanoid sighting. That's what they called them back then. They didn't mm -hmm. like to use the word alien in the 50s, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I think it's kind of a cool idea to continue that. We were going to do some more of the 1954 stuff. They had sightings in Italy. There were sightings in South yeah. America. Maybe we'll come back to that. Yeah. But I thought, let's move on to the 60s. Yeah. These are good cases. Bell bottoms, striped pants. Oh. Hair getting a little crazy. And, There's that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but amidst it all, there were some incredible encounters with uh, landed craft, non human beings that certainly seem non human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we got four that we're going to do today. Mm -hmm. And they're really incredible. Each one of them is an yeah. amazing case. Um, they're all, they're famous, but not all equally so. So uh, the first one is the. We've got 1964, 65, 66, and 67. Lonnie Zamora, Socorro, New Mexico in 1964. It's probably the most famous of these encounter cases and not hard to understand. It's a great case. However, the other three are amazing. 1965, uh, Maurice Maas, a French farmer working his lavender fields, has an incredible encounter. And he's a very believable guy. And we'll find out more about that. Mm -hmm. 1966, the Westall School near Melbourne in Australia, mm -hmm. a town called Clayton. Melbourne, or those who are Australian. Melbourne. Um, I actually got to go there to that school many years later and spoke to some of the researchers, and we have both looked into this case. That's an amazing case. Mm -hmm. No one saw beings there, but it's an incredible case. And mm -hmm. then finally, the 1967 Canadian, Manitoba, Falcon Lake, Stephen McCallick has an encounter, again, does not see beings, but does have a, um, a very detailed encounter with a craft. He actually saw two craft, had a close encounter with one, and had very severe physical after effects. So those are the four we're going to get into. Um, they're each important in their and own way. And we even have a coin made after this in Canada. Oh, yes, right. As of late. That's and right. uh, I was just razzing Richard before we started because he didn't have a picture of it. I thought he would have a picture of it. I have lots of visuals for tonight. I, I, didn't, I did not include that I visual. I should have made sure. It's a very unusual shaped coin. So, Right, right, right. And, you have um, to look it up. So you'll have to look that one up. I think it glows in the dark too. <laughs> You're in a happy mood tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think these are really interesting and fun cases. They're 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 fun in retrospect. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they weren't to fun the, at the time. Lonnie Zamora like was scared out of his mind, and I think the other three yeah. people were like, uh, but no, they're they're fun in the sense that they're vivid. They There's are. a lot of detail, and it's like it's 50 years later, so I think we can maybe mm -hmm. we can say sure they're fun, but mm -hmm. they're they're very very important all of them. Mm -hmm. so Agreed. There, anything else that you we want to get into? Sound like you're into? losing your voice a little bit. I brought, this is not coffee, this is water. So, <clears throat> yeah, well, well if I lose my voice, you're just gonna have to take over. Okay, I will. So you need to jump in. You know why he's losing his voice? Because we have, uh, you know, we're not proponents of uh, messenger and all of this. However. Oh, this is not why I'm losing my voice. This is why he's losing his voice. No. We have a seven-year-old niece and uh, this is she's kind this of adorable. A, she's so adorable and this is kind of embarrassing, but my sister set up uh, messenger kids and they have these little things on them where they will, uh, it's like augmented reality actually. And uh, so you put your face in there and it creates a little creature around you and you send them a message at, you know, at dressed up. It'll change your voice and your appearance and it's goofy stuff. So, as so we'll, a, we'll do them for our niece. Yes. Yeah, so they change them all go. the time. They change them every week. We always think about who makes up these things, you know, they're hilarious, but lately they have a little alien. They have a little alien driving around in a little spaceship, uh, 
catching stars and avoiding asteroids and it changes your voice. And so uh, we have been just killing ourselves, uh, creating these little things for just for our niece. Our niece thinks that we're <laughs> totally wackadoo now, which is probably but true. I would love to share them with you. Richard no. is the cutest little alien it's, I have ever seen. It's not happening. <laughs> that will not compute. That is not happening. It's not It's not wise losing his voice, but I just thought I'd razz you a little bit about that. I really, and I appreciate that very, very <laughs> much. So uh, well done. <laughs> so, um, but is fun. no, I think these are great cases. So let's just jump right in. Yeah. So I've got some, uh, uh, lots of visuals, actually, probably too many visuals. Uh, we, we want to get this I done on time. Too many. So this is it really interesting. I think it's great. I've got maps starting out with each one. So just so you can see where in the part of the world we're talking, Socorro, New Mexico. Again, this is a famous case. It takes place April 24th, <clears throat> 1964. It's a classic case. And uh, Lonnie Zamora uh, is a police sergeant, and he's actually pursuing a speeding vehicle. It's about a quarter to six in the evening, so it's still very light outside. We're in April 1964. And he hears something, he hears a roar from outside the car, and he sees what he described as a flame in the sky. So whatever that was, he he's thinking, you know, there's a nearby dynamite shack. I think, what if that's exploded? This is actually where his mind is going. And by the way, let's look at a picture of Lonnie Zamora there. That's the famous iconic picture of him. So gives up the chase, of course. He's not going to pull that driver over. He goes instead... Uh, he drives partially up the hill where he thinks this is going on, and then he walks the west, uh, the rest of the way, and he gets to the top and he sees a shiny object that's about 150 or 200 yards away. I didn't tell you, but uh, when I was looking this up, doing this today, I went outside to see how far I could see it, 200 yards. Mm -hmm. So, like, I know 200 yards. I know exactly where it is down. It's like the end of our block. Right. So I stood outside and I thought, how well. Can I, how much detail can I see? And I can, I can tell you at 200 yards, that's doable. Uh, if you've got halfway decent eyes, you know, Lonnie Zamora wore glasses, he had corrective lenses. I'm going to guess he actually had a pretty decent view of things. And then he starts walking toward, toward it. So his first uh, and th thought is that this was a car that had overturned and he goes closer and then he sees what it looks like are two children. And actually it turns out he got to within, he believes close to a hundred feet. This is really close. Yeah. So he sees two, what look like children in white coveralls. And in fact, I'm going to move to some of the images. There's a ton of images here. This is what he initially thought was an overturned car. And there's lots of artists who've done images of this craft. It's an egg shaped craft on four legs. Okay. And this actually, I think, is a very good artist's representation of what um, Lonnie Zamora might have been able to see. And you notice there's an image on that. I'll get to that in a moment. But he sees these two short, the artist here made them look out, look like uh, astronauts. And I don't think that's quite accurate at all. But he does see like these children look like they're examining or repairing this craft or whatever they're doing. And they didn't notice him at first. Then they notice him and they hurry back into the object. Here's another artist. Uh, again, there's a lot of these representations out there. And here's a very famous illustration. And this is them seeing Zamora. And they're like, we're going to get back into the craft, right? So he had a pretty good view. There's not a lot of obstructions. And at this point, Zamora is maybe afraid, maybe he just wants to get back to his car, but um, he, he leaves. I, I'm assuming he was kind of scared. He hears a roar and he comes back and he sees a flame on the underside of the craft. That's interesting. And he sees it slowly ascending and he, he's now able to make out that it's an oval shaped object and he sees it's very smooth and uh, what's my next slide here? And there's Lonnie Zamora watching it kind of take off there. Um, and then it just accelerates toward the uh, southwest. 
by the time it, it was gone, there was no flame. It was silent. There was no trail at all. So he was so shocked by this. He made a report of this immediately and actually asked to see a priest before he released this report to the authorities. I mean, very simply, he believed he saw an alien craft. And this case got everyone down to take a look at this. Within two hours, Army intelligence, this is, by the way, Zamora's drawing of the craft. And he just saw this symbol of on the side of it, as best as he could uh, recreate it. Army intelligence came down over from White Sands Proving Ground along with an FBI agent. This is Zamora in his later years, by the way. He lived uh, for quite a few years after that. Here's Lonnie Zamora with uh, some of the Blue Book team. That's Sergeant David Moody, Moody of Blue Book and a Major William Connor of Kirtland Air Force Base. They've got Geiger counters. There's other people around. J. Allen Hynek arrived the next day. Uh, Air Force Intelligence investigated. The CIA had a file on this. They probably had investigators there. You had NICAP and APRO. That was the civilian organizations. A couple of years later, Philip Class, the debunker, showed up. Everyone in the world except Class thought that this was one of the most compelling of any of the UFO encounters. And the thing was, Lonnie Zamora was subjected to a almost a continuous barrage of interviews by all the investigators who were there. And everyone was impressed by Lonnie Zamora. There's some newspaper accounts of it uh, that came out right away, actually. And he was honest. He seemed genuinely puzzled. He seemed even like in shock. He had a very detailed report. No one questioned his integrity uh, or his ability to have seen what he claimed to have seen. The other reason that people believed him is that there were markings left on by the legs of the craft. Here's an image of one of them. Uh, here's another. Oh, this is, oh, let me come back to this in a moment. But there were marks left of the craft. And this is what like, got people like Alan Hynek to say this was a real physical event. There was apparently charring on the ground. Um, so that's the end of that. The newspaper accounts here, this is, these are two interesting things. And it just shows that there were other witnesses. This is a young girl who apparently got close to a UFO in the very uh, same time frame as Zamora's sighting and was sick for a while. This is actually her lying in bed that day. And there was another motorist, and this is an article who described the article, the object as a flying bathtub, similar to it. But uh, all of this was near Socorro. So, and of course you do have the, uh, apparent landing of an object at Holloman Air Force Base one day um, apart from the Socorro case. I'm not going to get into the Holloman landing. Maybe we can talk about that in the future. But the point is that there, I think that these people were seeing the same object. This is um, some of the ground traces again and the charring. It's Maybe you can make that out there. Now, um, the Blue Book chief, uh, Hector Quintanilla, Quintanilla did not uh, publicly give this case any credit, but privately. He wrote a classified article a couple of years later for the journal Studies and Intelligence. It's a CIA publication, and this is what he wrote here. He didn't endorse the extraterrestrial hypothesis in this article, but look what he says here. There is no doubt that Lonnie Zamora saw an object which left quite an impression on him. There is no question about his reliability. He is puzzled by what he saw, and frankly, so are we. This is the best documented case on record, and we still, and still we have been unable, in spite of a thorough investigation, to find the vehicle or other stimulus that scared Zamora to the point of panic. So this is a big case. Philip Class comes in and says, ah, the whole thing was a hoax. Town just wants to create more tourism. That was just a ridiculous, insulting explanation. And there's no truth to it whatsoever, of course. Uh, NICAP was deeply affected by this. In fact, let me just, I think the next image. Yeah, this is Ray Stanford. Uh, this is a young Ray Stanford here with NICAP. There's Lonnie Zamora and another officer. I know Ray Stanford, and I will just tell you, he's one of the most brilliant, highly intelligent UFO researchers I have ever met. And he was on the scene with NICAP. 
this case forced NICAP to reconsider their whole position on sightings of occupants or beings. Uh, up till then, NICAP had just said, nope, not possible, ridiculous, crazy people only report this. But after this case, NICAP totally changed their opinion. Stanford goes down there, and his story is actually really, really an interesting kind of final chapter. Um, so late, later in the year, Stanford's there. Uh, actually, not later in the year. He Later in the year, he goes with one of the samples that he picks up back to uh, Maryland, to the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt, Maryland. And he says, I'm gonna get the lab there to analyze metals that were on one of the rocks that I got from the landing site. This is really an incredible story. He meets or speaks with a Dr. Henry Frankel, who's head of NASA's spacecraft systems branch and Frankel says, yes, I'm going to analyze this and I'm going to uh, run the analysis. And I will agree to Stanford's request, he says, that we'll only take half of the rock's metal off of it. We'll only scrape off half. We'll leave you the rest. So his initial statement to Stanford was, these particles look like they'd been in a molten state when they got onto the rock. That's interesting. When they returned the rock to Stanford, the whole rock had been uh, scraped clean. And Stanford just said, there's nothing, not a speck of metal left. So he calls Frankel like a week later, we're in early August. And Frankel tells him, and this is a quote that Stanford got from Frankel. The particles are comprised of a material that could not occur naturally. This definitely strengthens the case that might be made for an extraterrestrial origin of the Socorro object. So despite the fact that they scraped the rock clean, Stanford was at least, you know, uh, happy that the, he got this kind of an answer. So Frankel says, look, look, call me in a week after I do further analysis. So August 12th, 1964, it's a week later, Stanford calls Frankel's office, can't reach him, only gets his secretary. Frankel's not available, she says. Stanford calls again the next day, no luck. He calls again a couple of days later. Secretary says, Dr. Frankel is unprepared at this time to discuss the information you are calling about. Several more times, Stanford keeps calling. This is persistence, my friends. August 20th, Stanford gets a phone call from a man named Thomas P. Siaka, Jr. of NASA's Spacecraft Systems Branch. And this is what Siaka says to him. I have been appointed to call you and report the official conclusion of the Socorro sample analysis. Dr. Frankel is no longer involved with the matter. So in response to your repeated inquiries, I want to tell you the results of the analysis. Everything you were told earlier by Dr. Frankel was a mistake. The sample was determined to be wow. silica. Uh, and I mean, wow. Yeah. Wow. What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, just absolutely out of, you know, completely crystal clear, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, cover up of the information. Um, so there you go. That's that's an amazing case. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ray Stanford is. Um, is still around and he's one of the most uh, um like worthy to have conversations with of all the researchers I've ever known. Like you, you never, um, you never go wanting when Ray Stanford talks about anything with UFOs. He's one of the best photo analysts of UFOs I think that I've ever met, or maybe the best. He's just uh, he's kind of a genius in a lot of ways in terms of how to look at things in the right way. He's very scientific. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's his contribution to the Socorro case. What do you think of that? Wow, that case is a wow. It is a wow. Hynek was deeply impressed by it. Um, I, I would say that this is one of those cases that kind of started to turn Alan Hynek mm. more proactively right. toward. Uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't enough to turn him yet publicly, but I think it had a deep impact on him. Right. So and there are definitely some similarities in these cases, even though they happened in different parts of the world. Right, because the one we're yeah. going to go to next, Valencel, France, is actually very, has a lot in common with the uh, case we just discussed with Lonnie mm -hmm. Zamora. And mm -hmm. 
this is one I know you know a little bit about. You were mm -hmm. uh, studying this case as well. So we can get into this. Let me um, give a map to the uh, folks here. Let's see, share the screen. So, Valenso, this is in the south of France. This is in a beautiful part of the world. We're in Provence, not far from Italy, near the Mediterranean. Uh, we're in the summer of 1965, July 1st, actually. Canada Day. That's right. On the other and side of the birthday. ocean. And my birthday, indeed. Um, I was three years old on this very day. And <laughs> so I was here with us. I just wasn't able to do much in terms of investigation. So this is where Valensole is, uh, the big yellow dot. You have a farmer named Maurice Moss. It's 5.45 in the morning. The man is smoking a cigarette. He's just about to start work that day. And there's an object that descends from the sky, lands in a lavender field 200 feet away. This is very close. Mm -hmm. In his okay. lavender field, yeah. Now, he, he had been dealing, hadn't he, with these bare patches on his lavender uh, he was like, what's going on with this? And he's wondering, are there kids? Are there hooligans? Is someone messing with my lavender? And now he's thinking, oh, a helicopter is landing on my lavender field. So he's a little bit annoyed. And he goes out there. It's like thinking some helicopter has made an unauthorized landing. And he goes toward it. And he's he's hearing this loud hissing sound. That's what's reported. Right. This right. really, this really strong attention. sound that, yeah. He thought was something like that. Well, he gets closer to this thing and he's realizing this doesn't look like a helicopter because it's oval shape. It's very similar shape to the craft that uh, Zamora saw. That's as right. As far as I can tell. Yeah. And it's uh, on four legs, I believe. I don't know how many. I legs. saw one account that might that said it might have been six legs, but I've always thought it was four legs. So he sees what look like children, and this is again like Zamora's yeah. case. Yeah. And like, was this your encounter when you were looking into this? Like he was a little bit annoyed thinking that these, th there's a bit of a disconnect here. Cause if you think it's a helicopter landing, you're not going to think there's kids out there, but maybe it was early in the morning. Maybe he hadn't had his coffee. I don't know what he was <laughs> thinking. He goes out there, but he very quickly realizes that these were not human beings because they're short. They're like four feet tall or less. Mm -hmm. They're wearing a tight, uh kind of clothing greenish grayish large heads mm -hmm. let's uh let's move to long one of the arms images. this is maurice moss by the way and this is lavender field mm -hmm. by the way everyone described him as a very uh genial a very level-headed a very good man and he had actually been a resistance fighter during the second world war he had fought for the french resistance so maurice moss yeah he had a lot of respect from everyone who knew him. There he is. Uh, this is another picture of him. He's got a nice face, very um, kind of an open looking man. Um, this is a very artistic, creative rendering of the beings that he sees. That's. But yeah, so the beings were described as short, bald. Uh, right. They looked like they were eight or nine years old as far as height. You know, they, they were very right. small. They had very large heads. Right. Uh, they had a hole instead of a mouth. Right. They had very large ears, which that's something that's, you know, very different than yes, what you usually hear for they this have, type. These, this um, rendition doesn't show the large ears. This one shows a bit larger. This one I've seen many times. Someone kind of superimposed these beings over a photograph of the lavender. Uh, and there's a couple of others that I have here. This is, uh, I think, one of the better known ones. But yeah, they have no, these, these are like gray aliens, and that's not quite accurate like the image here with larger ears you're saying we yeah large not... ears was something that's right. very unusual yeah about it but but still the large head still the large eyes and, and the, the slanted the slanted eyes is definitely um part of what he described and they were making mm -hmm. a, a noise that was like a grumbling sound whatever that means or a gurgling sound um the Im impression that one gets from this case is that they were interested in the lavender. lavender. Um, but, you know, I don't see any of the description, large bald head, pale faces, all of that. So as he gets close enough to them, he sees that these are not kids. One of them aims like a tube, like right there, a tube-like device at him. And 
he gets hit with some kind of beam or ray which freezes him or paralyzes him mm -hmm. but he's not unconscious and mm -hmm. he's totally conscious during this mm -hmm. and aware so he's watching what's happening even though he's paralyzed he's able to sort of watch and observe right so this paralysis lasts for about 20 minutes and um, I think it was shortly after they paralyzed him that they just got back into the craft and left. They did. There was really yeah. nothing else that they did there. So uh, this actually messed him up a little bit. Uh, let's see if there's any other images here. Oh, we'll get that's ground traces. We'll get to that in a second. Well, can I just interject here? Something yeah, that happened. Means. The initial report. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, he didn't even describe this. Uh, he was. He reported that one was on the ground. This. And yeah. one was in the craft and that they eventually just flew away. Now, you know, he was a farmer. He wasn't used to all of the attention. When this came out, all sorts of press was after him. And he right. actually went away, stayed at a friend's place for a month and a half to get away from all of this. You know, he yeah. really, he didn't want the attention. Right. But, he Right. He was just very uh, quiet and humble. Um, right. And then... Uh, I guess he thought about it after a month and a half, right. and he came back, and he went to the police. And now, did he get? Didn't he go to the police immediately though? No. What happened? What when he first had this happen? The he first went, he went to the local tavern or local. He went. Yes. Well, right. it's a. It was a very small town, so this yeah. is where all of his friends were. Right. Right. The owner of the bar, which uh, you know, Robert Fleischer was deeply investigating this and so he was telling us this story robert fleischer is one of the leading ufo researchers in germany and he's, he's a friend of ours and he just happens to be looking into the valence case right. currently yeah yeah and uh, very recently as well this was in uh, uh 2018 i think yeah yeah um so he said that andre who owned the bar or cafe mm -hmm. du sport um it was also a very good friend of his. He told him and said, please don't tell anyone. Right. But it's this really small town. So he ends up telling everybody. Right, of course. And within a few hours, uh, the police want to talk to him. Right. And this, but so before, this is all immediately, and they notice there's marks. There are yes, ground they, traces. So the police are super interested. They actually right. and go and later. do the investigation on that day. And they see there's four landing marks in the soil. Mm -hmm. There's uh, there's like a deep hole. Yeah. And it was but very moist, actually, mm -hmm. which then hardened into something like concrete. That's right. Apparently, yeah. And whatever that was. Now, I was reading in one case that there was an, al an analysis that said that the weight of the craft or whatever landed on it had to be quite significant, maybe one and a half tons or even up to two tons. I don't know how they make these determinations, but someone decided that this was a very large or heavy craft. I'm not sure either, but uh, Robert did say that when they did the initial investigation, they did a police investigation, not uh, a UFO investigation. Right, you know? okay. Um, so uh, they they were looking at it through a specific uh, lens, you know, through specific right. eyes. But what I was gonna say was, um, the initial report that he gave was different. And then when he came back a month and a half later, he went back to the police. And gave more detail. And right? gave more yeah. detail. And that's when he described that there were two beings standing right. here, like you're seeing here. Yeah. He said one was facing him, one was turned away. The one, when the one facing him saw him, he nudged the other one. The one that was turned away turned around and mm -hmm. had a wand in his hand. Right and then paralyzed him, yeah. seemed to paralyze him with that hand. So, right, and then that's when uh, there, he did uh, go into, have had more interviews after that with a number of people. Uh, one of the things that, one of the encounters in the interviews that he had is someone showed him uh, a drawing of the object that landed in Socorro. So investigators, you know, after the fact said, oh, did it look like this? And they, they showed a picture of Lonnie Zamora's uh, egg-shaped craft. Oh, right. And, uh, and Ma says, ah, someone else has seen my UFO. So he he saw this image of the Socorro craft and said it was really basically exactly the same. Um, he was affected in terms of his sleep. That's right. And read, he was always like a five hours a night well, kind yeah, of a guy. Yeah, he was a farmer. So he, you know, he was used to getting up super early in the morning, 5.30, and he was unable to do this. He was changed since this, since this happened. He said that he needed, you know, between, between 10 and 12 hours a day. For for a while. Yeah. For at least for months, uh, a couple for months of months. Following yeah. it, yeah. So it really, some, something um, 
and also about them. watches. Do you recall that? Or no. Did you come across that? No, describe that. Uh, that he was having trouble with uh, watches, that they would either go, <laughs> excuse me, too fast, too slow, or they would stop. So he was just unable we to wear them anymore. So um, this was sort of another thing that had happened. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, one other thing I just want to mention is Jacques Vallée, a uh, number of years later, I think 14 years later, 1979, met with Maurice Maas. Maas lived, by the way, into his 90s. He was 94 when he finally uh, passed away. Vallée was very impressed by Maas. He met him with uh, two of his close friends. And he just pointed out, he said, Maurice Maas was, did not really want to give all the details to investigators or, or even to his own family, in, including the fact that he believed some kind of silent telepathic communication took place between himself and the beings. So this is really something that affected him very powerfully. And just as you were saying, he it took him a while to really, by degrees, get into all of the details of what mm -hmm. he... Mm -hmm. But Valet just said, I was very impressed by him. He says, throughout these discussions with Mr. Moss, I had the feeling that I was in the presence of a very intelligent man, capable of deep emotions and rational thought. He was also quite humble. And um, it's kind of a nice statement. It says, it says quite a bit about Jacques Valet to have these thoughts about another person, but I think it says a lot about Maurice Moss. Um, I was just noticing and in looking into this case, there are other, there's a gentleman, Maurice Chaspol, who was a friend of Maurice Moss. And a lifetime friend. A lifetime friend. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman, I think, has been very hospitable to some of the German investigators who've come in. Robert Fleischer is mm -hmm. one of them, but mm -hmm. he's not the only one. And so this gentleman had gave an interview in French. It's on YouTube. And um, and he gives additional support to the whole Maurice Moss incident. This is in Val and Soul. That's the uh, the field. I believe that's the exact field where Moss uh, lived. Uh, there's a highway right off the road now. But um, anyway, it's a very interesting case and definitely worth um, some investigation and definitely a strong case, I think. I agree. Now, Robert told us a few extra things that were very interesting. Uh, he said that uh, according to Maurice Chospoul that mm -hmm. we're looking at here, who, by the way, was well, a retired politician. We took, we took oh. him off, but oh, we uh, did. yeah, we can put it back on. They're looking at us now. <laughs> okay. Um, he was able to uh, ask Maurice, you know, was this Maurice? Maurice Moss. Yeah. No, he was able to ask Maurice Chospoul oh. uh, if the other Maurice who this happened to was mm -hmm. ever interested in UFOs. You know, was oh, he ever previously. interested in this? And he said, absolutely not. You know, he was a humble farmer. He wasn't interested in it before. He wasn't interested in it, in, in it after. But there were some other things that came out that were kind of uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. That there were a couple of other witnesses in a lavender field nearby on the same day that reported this hissing sound as well. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Good. And Maurice, uh, Maurice Chospu also mentioned uh, that there was this possibility of missing time that some people were w wondering about because this happened around uh, between 5.30 and 5.45 in the morning. He showed up at the, um, at the uh, Café du Sport about three hours later. And he just said he stayed, he just stayed on the tractor and did his work. But, but they were all questioning. You just, ha he just has this experience uh, right. his lavender is burned, by the way. Uh, and the, yeah, the field... plant, the plants were very, uh, adversely affected. I meant to mention this. That's right. Uh, and the closer to the center of where this object apparently landed, the worse it was. And the, the soil became hardened very, very quickly. Yeah. So they're wondering, you know, how, why would he work after this happened? How did he work? So a lot of them didn't really, you know, people question this, what happened during those three hours. Um, and Moss didn't have a really a good answer. No, he, yeah. he didn't. And yeah. then um, his uh, one year later, apparently uh, something happened to him again. He came in from the farm and his wife had said that he looked super pale, mm -hmm. like something was wrong. And apparently he s told his wife they had come again. He said they, ha he told her that they hadn't landed or anything, but that 
he'd wished that she had seen what he had seen. I'm glad you mentioned that again. And I remembered learning about that years ago. And, you know, back in the 60s, it was definitely a no-no for a witness to claim that he saw or she saw a UFO twice. Yeah. Like once was considered like a once in a lifetime event. And for to have it happen twice up close, people thought, oh, you're just looking for attention. You're crazy. Right. Now we think a little differently. What mm -hmm. if he had been taken? Mm -hmm. And what if they wanted to come back a second time? Like we will never really know because his memory of both of those incidents might be uh, incomplete, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Robert Fleischer did say that, uh, that Maurice said one day he would tell his grandson the whole story. And so when Robert told us that, I said, is that, his grandson that Maurice still alive? Would tell, his grandson. would tell his grandson the whole story, implying that there was a lot more that he hadn't said. And uh, I, so what's the deal I with remember the saying to Robert, know? is he alive? Has he said anything? And uh, Robert said, unfortunately, no, uh, Maurice died. And, you know, perhaps his grandson knows something and isn't saying anything, or maybe he doesn't know. So um, it's just, you know, fascinating. Yeah. I like all the extra details. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I find that a, an absolutely fascinating story. So he's another witness like Lonnie Zamora, where you really can't say anything against this man. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone who knew him, liked him, respected him, trustworthy, Yeah, no nonsense, right. nice, a really genuinely right. good guy. And he was not seeking the attention. You know, right. when all the press came to him, he ran away because <laughs> he didn't right. want to be around it. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, when we were just looking at that uh, craft, picture mm -hmm. of the craft, I was thinking Tic Tac. Tic-tac oh, UFO. So I mean, it just, it you know, we keep hearing these days of the tic-tac. Well, we'll do a quick little uh, share back again. And uh, yeah, well, it is right? it egg shaped. It, it is. It's actually a little smaller. The tic-tac UFO that we, we all hear about now from 2004 is about 40 feet long. This is shorter, but you got that sh uh, kind of sleek, nice shape. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. actually. So it just kind of interesting. So let's move on to the next case. We've got two to go here. We're, we're halfway through. We're going to go to Australia now. And this is the Westall case. I want to share the screen again. You can see right where we're talking about. Right by Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne. I don't quite say it the true Aussie way. It's true. <laughs> I, I spent a long time Melbourne, there. So. Melbourne is how they like to say it. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not getting it quite right. Love the Aussies. Some of the nicest, most just genuine people like you most ever meet. Most hospitable, yeah, totally. wonderful people. If you can't get along with anyone from Australia, then there's something wrong with you. Like seriously. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, this is where the Westall School was, uh, just outside Melbourne in a place called Clayton. And this is now April 6th, 1966. So about a year, almost a year after the Maurice Moss incident. In France. So this is an incredible case because you've got about 200 students and teachers who see an object. Here's a nice picture. Look at these kids. Like this is some of the kids in the school. Like they're not little children that you can just say, oh, you don't know what you saw. These That's are right. very like very uh, sharp looking kids, in my opinion. They're in their, um, you know, different ages, but many of them are in their teens. This is a high school. Right, this is a high school. So this is, they're a little bit older than say the Zimbabwe case. That's right, from 1994, mm -hmm. uh, who are much, much younger. Which so, was another school, you know, school case. So we don't really have an explanation. This is almost, uh, it's more than 50 years later now, and there's no explanation as to what happened. You've got a lot of evidence, a lot of testimony. It's not all exactly the same testimony, but it's close enough mm -hmm. that you clearly know something important happened. And I'm just going to jump ahead here and, and say the Australian government has given basically nothing That's on right. this case. The Australian military has given nothing on this. And you've got these ridiculous explanations like weather balloon. I'm like, are you serious? We'll get to all of that. So the kids, this is one uh, drawing. There's a couple of really good artists' uh, renditions of this. Basically, the kids have been out. It was like a recess or a sporting event. And they're heading back 
in. They were, I think they were playing cricket. They, this was actually 11 in the morning and it yeah. was right before recess. Mm -hmm. So because there were all these different grades, a lot of them were doing different things. Some of them were in class and some of them were out on the field, you know, playing cricket, like I assume like a gym class kind of thing. So yeah, it happened right before recess. And that's why you get these differing accounts. Some of them were already outside. Some of them were inside the building. Right. And so they look up and it's like, there's a flying saucer. <laughs> and then years later, this is what they're all saying. Yeah. We all looked up and we saw like, this was a flying saucer. Uh, and yet a lot of these witnesses are like, this was not a weather balloon. I'm adamant. This was not a balloon. This is not any aircraft, nothing conventional. Uh, one, Witness, this is typical. He says it was a round silver disc, seemed to be, be very low over the school. And I remember kids screaming and running. Some were running toward it and some were running inside. And there were <laughs> teachers inside and outside who also saw this thing. So now did you uh, read this whole thing? There's the initial disc whatever this thing was seen and then witnesses saw a collection of smaller yes. objects circling around it or following it, about yes. five of them some people described it as sort of one main saucer and then these five smaller craft that were buzzing around it buzzing it right that's how i heard it described over and over this image this drawing has like birds but this isn't really quite what we're talking about here um let me move on to the next image. Now, some witnesses saw multiple objects, didn't they? That's right. Some of them saw three craft. Right. Uh, some of them said they saw one craft. But again, I think this is because people were in different areas. I mean, mm -hmm. there could be other reasons too, but uh, there are different accounts. And I think that's what you expect when you get a lot of people uh reporting it and some are looking exactly. out of windows and right. some are you know so what we do know what happened i don't know what happened to the five objects that were around it they seem to be gone after a brief period of time it seems to me the at least one object maybe more than one object mm -hmm. goes toward and they have a nearby area they all called the grange it was like a pasture mm -hmm. and some of the kids ran off after at least one of these objects that yes. either landed or appeared to land. Let's see if, what images I have here. And these are some descriptions that um, people have given of the object. There was one girl named that Tanya. That was drawn by a witness, yeah. That, Do you want to talk about Tanya? Uh, yeah, well, Tanya was apparently the first to reach the site. There, right. was a, a, there were a group of three girls, as I understand it, that mm -hmm. ran out. Now, I was listening to the uh, account of one of them. Was that uh, Jacqueline? This was actually Terry Peck. Uh, ah, okay. Okay. Right. So she runs out with Tanya and another girl. The other two girls get ahead of her. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, Tanya was uh one of them was hysterical and one of them fainted so it was yeah. tanya who was hysterical now there was another girl uh there named i think it was jackie yeah and she wasn't quite at this area yet she said tanya came running out of this of the grange towards mm -hmm. her screaming so instead of pursuing and going to the craft she ran back to the school with tanya okay okay tanya there some claims that tanya had touched the craft i don't know about yeah. that but tanya got taken away in an ambulance right. and this part of the story comes up later it gets really interesting this is jackie argent was her name is the friend's name jacqueline argent yes because years later right. she talked quite a lot about this in fact i know i've got a picture of her uh oh here's some more images so you can just see according to the descriptions uh we're not talking a huge craft here that's the size of a adult man and let's see what else we've got here uh, i don't know who drew this uh two craft but uh there was a gentleman i don't know his name he was uh a, a young boy at the time and he said he saw two crafts okay so that's and his he was then. super close to them he said there was heat coming off them but he he witnessed the two side by side like this so you want to go back to tanya though what happened with her she gets taken so off so tanya ambulance. uh gets taken away in the ambulance and nobody ever sees her again again and her okay. friend jacqueline tried to visit her her friend yeah tries to visit her the next day goes to the house where she's always gone to visit her right. and there's someone there who is not 
uh, Tanya's mother because right. Tanya's mother did not speak English. This person spoke English and said Tanya never lived here. This is Jacqueline Argent in a documentary uh, many years later. That's right. As an, as an adult. Uh, she had a lot to say. She's a really good witness to this case. She is. Uh, there are other good ones as well, but she, uh, I really like listening to her. You can find documentaries and information interviews with her out there on the uh, on YouTube and on the web. She's in a documentary called West Westall 66, a suburban UFO mystery. Yeah. And this is from People that documentary, I believe. Yeah. So but, one of the things, well, can I just say one yeah. thing she says is like, after the object or objects left, the school principal calls an emergency assembly of the whole school and all That's the right. faculty. And this is what he says. What you saw wasn't real. It didn't happen. And no one ever should talk about this ever again. And if you do, you're going to get in trouble. And he had, there were men in uh, suits. No one knew who these guys were. They were apparently government officials, military, who knows. And they are talking to the children. And they, they're saying, what you saw was nothing but an experimental craft. And by the way, don't ever talk about this again. Uh, <laughs> Jack, Jacqueline uh, Argent talks about this. In fact, I got a quote from her in here. I'm just going to show it. So she just, she talks about it. She says, I was called down to the headmaster's office. There were two uh, well-dressed men in suits. They were introduced to me in person and I don't know where they came from. And, and um, I just love hearing her talk. She says, we went into, oh, I suppose you think you saw a flying saucer. I said, well, I didn't say that. I said, I saw an object. And we suppose you saw little green men. So she's, you know, talking about how they're, uh, essentially just dismissing her there. This is a newspaper article. This is what, one of the only documentary sources of the case. I just want to add that she actually yeah. claims that they were quite bullied by these uh, mysterious men that were coming to the, to the school. Yeah, I think she said she burst into tears after she mm -hmm. left the meeting. Like they were really mm -hmm. heavy handed, these guys. Mm -hmm. There are no Australian government records of this event. People can only work off the newspaper, even though the new the principal said no one talks about this. Journalists did get wind of it and they did do an investigation. But the impression you get from this is like because there was this heavy handed silence that came down right away on this case. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of good information didn't come out. Yeah, unfortunately, right yeah, I think the school really shut that down. Yeah. But, um, you know, it did get some media attention because it was on the front page of the local paper and it, and, uh, it ran for a couple of weeks. And they also had a uh, Channel 9, I guess, in, right. the, in their area, a TV uh, news spot on this. And some of the kids were actually interviewed for that. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me, they got in trouble for it. They actually uh. Uh, got detention. Joy Clark is one of those people uh, who claims that she got detention for speaking to them, you yeah, know? Yeah. It's so amazing. That 1966 that in Australia, I guess they felt they could do that. Um, this was on the weather balloon explanation actually was, was put out there when it was reported. Uh, people uh, were told that a weather balloon had been released earlier that morning. You've got a, you know, only the most dense, or obstinate government spokespeople, in my opinion, could possibly believe the weather balloon explanation. And yet even recently, Australian TV uh, put out a little piece on this when the documentary came out. And they bring out this talking head who says, oh, yes, you know, weather balloons can really surprise people. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, this is 2010, yeah. buddy, and you're still actually yeah. trying this out. Well, they've got to be kidding. Uh, uh, you know, the, on the anniversary of this, uh, 60 years later, I believe, mm -hmm. You know, they they asked these kids because they're adults now. And they said, what do you think of the whole weather balloon thing? And they all said, I mean, that's crazy. I know what I saw. Right. I know what I saw. All of them are, you know, sticking uh, to their story. It was the principal years later says this is a direct quote. I was prepped to tell the students that what they had seen didn't exist. Here's another witness. It was not an aircraft by any stretch of the imagination, and it certainly was not a weather balloon. Um, when the uh, local Melbourne News wanted to cover this years later, they looked through the archives and they found all the original video of the event was missing. That's right. It's like, where did that go? It's this is Paul Smith. 
Um, he was one of the witnesses. He says, I looked up and I was facing the object in the sky. And he thought someone figured out how to project an image into the sky. He says, this is just too crazy. It was like too good of a flying saucer. This could not be real. Mm -hmm. And he said, after a while, trucks turned up, looked like army trucks. And uh, there was another, one of the teachers had said that a man in a dark blue suit demanded all photos taken. That's right. Uh, there was a woman in particular, I, I think she was a chemistry teacher there, and she had taken a whole bunch of pictures. And, you know, as soon as this happened, she just grabbed her camera and just took tons of photos. And right. yeah, they did. They confiscated not only the pictures, but the cameras. Yeah, I mean, just incredible stuff. And yet this is all from what? A weather balloon. You've got to be kidding me. Right. Um, even years later, uh, the Australian government was moving toward the position of saying, or at least some military uh, spokesperson anyway, was saying, well, maybe, you know, there's all kinds of secrets and there's experimental craft. But what could this be 50 years later? Mm -hmm. Like that they're still going to deny. Um, one teacher was named Andrew Greenwood. He actually said that two officers came to his home and threatened him under the Official Secrets Act and said, you couldn't have seen a flying saucer at Westall because, well, there's no such things as flying saucers. And if you talk about this, we will tell everyone that you're an alcoholic. Guy was not an alcoholic. Wow. These are some more of the witnesses, by the way. These are just very, very good, uh, straightforward people. So I just want to read one more witness testimony. Okay. Yeah. This is Terry Peck. Uh, she, okay. So she said she was outside playing cricket. And she saw uh, three unusual craft hovering over the school, and they were definitely not normal aircraft. Uh, after 10 minutes, we saw one go down into an area behind our school called the Grange mm -hmm. that you were talking about, where we did our cross-country runs. I was one of the first group over the fence to arrive there. It was on the ground in front of me. The other two girls had arrived before me. One was hysterical and the other had fainted, as I was mentioning before. Yeah. Um, she said, I just looked at it. After a few minutes, it just raised up above me, about 12 feet, turned directly on its side, and went zoom straight up into the air and disappeared almost instantly. And uh, there were two other craft in the air at the time. So that what do you do with witness testimony that's so clear like yeah. that's so straightforward and there's so many of them mm -hmm. and the only thing the australian government's been able to do is just pretend the whole thing didn't happen no records that's right deny 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 weather balloon experimental and that australian news uh uh, uh newscast cast that i was looking at after all these witnesses are talking about government uh pressure you have one of the pro-government spokespeople uh, They cut to him and he says, well, after all these years, you know, people develop a lot of personal elaborations on the case. And I just saw what an insult. Right. Yeah. What an insult to yeah. the witnesses. I think that's to actually feeling. Yeah. cut to this guy at that moment uh, to I'm undercut sure. everything that they actually experienced. I mean, look, we don't have any photographs. Apparently they were confiscated. We don't. We don't have government records because those are unavailable. We've got 200 people who saw something mm -hmm. crystal clear, and some of them all too clear. Mm -hmm. And one of them, this girl named Tanya, I think paid a very, very significant price for her encounter. Yeah, as we were saying, they said uh, <clears throat> that her friend had never seen her again. However, she had been in touch with a, an Australian researcher and was okay, but she just preferred to stay in... Uh, to have her privacy. And I, I'm not sure what happened after that with her. There were some rumors, but I wasn't able to confirm them in time. I, I was at the Westall location. I was uh, fortunate to, to uh, visit Melbourne and I met with the Victorian UFO group there. Very excellent group of researchers there, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they took me to that location. And uh, I, spoke with a lot of the researchers who knew the case very, very well. And it was it was just fascinating to hear it from them who had spent a lot of time looking of into it. It's a very, very, uh, it's a personal case for the folks who live in that area to this day. Well, yeah, the level of response is what really uh, gets a lot of people. So the government yeah. authorities, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Army, yeah. the Civil Defense Organization, all of these responded. Yet, uh, you know, they did this 
thorough, extensive search uh, through the government documents mm -hmm. and couldn't find anything anywhere. And I just want to say they went through like the DOD, external affairs, Army, Air Force, Navy, like nothing exists anywhere. But there was right. this massive, massive response it to happened, it. It happened, yeah. So it was um, a real thing. It happened. And yet this is what we deal with, with this phenomenon. Like people will say there's no such thing as a cover up. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is just one more example right. of obvious cover up. You you have to get, as I said before, you have to be the most dense, obstinate person to look at this evidence and then just say, no, no, there's really nothing to it. It's just totally prosaic and conventional. Well, give us some something to work with here. What conventional explanations are you talking about that could make everyone say this was a flying saucer mm -hmm. um, and with all of the other effects that it, it left. So we have That's one right. more case to get to. How about we get to it? Okay. This is from, from your native land, <laughs> by the way. Let's uh, do right. a map. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> to my knowledge, you weren't one to hang out much at uh, in Manitoba. In the prairies, no. I spent mm -hmm. a winter there <clears throat> in winter peg, as we call it, in Winnipeg, it which is in Manitoba. There. Too cold for me. Too cold for most Canadians there. Even, even <laughs> Canadians, they can handle it, but no. Well, this was not a winter case. This was uh, in May, May 20th, 1967. Mm -hmm. So we had 64, we had 65, we had 66, and now we're going just, just north of the U.S. border, about uh, 45 miles, I think, in. And there's Manit this is where Falcon Lake is in Manitoba, just north of Winnipeg. And um, this is another really, really good case. So... We're May 20th, and Stefan Michalik was a, an amateur geologist, and he had worked in that particular area many times. Let me show you a picture of Stefan Michalik. And this is actually him sometime after the event with a drawing of the craft that he had made. He was actually, he was a very intelligent man. He spoke multiple languages. I, I believe he was Polish. He had moved to Canada and spoke uh, a number of languages, uh, which actually is relevant. We'll come to that in a moment. This is Stephen McCallick. So he had worked that particular area many times. He was looking for silver, actually. So it's just afternoon, it's about 12, 15 in the afternoon, May, so it's a nice day. And he's working and he hears geese cackling nearby they're disturbed by something that gets his attention and he looks up and he sees two cigar shaped objects with bumps as he described it later so i assume the bump was on the top of the object so there he then gets a better look they're disc shaped and they're descending together at a kind of a low angle to close to the ground and one of them stops just above the ground like low treetop level and the other one keeps going down and lands on uh, like a flat top of a rock that is fairly large. And it's, we're talking about 160 feet from him, 160 feet. This is very, very close. So the one in the air just leaves and it changes all kinds of colors. It goes red, it goes orange and so on as it flies off to the west and it's gone. So there's one craft, it's on the ground and this is what Mikalek is looking at. He spends a half hour with this looking at this object as it changes colors. And this is a close-up of his drawing. He actually drew this at the time while looking at the craft. Wow. Yeah. So um, there were no markings on it. It, uh, it yes. had a, like an iridescence to it. He said it was like bright red and orange. Um, no markings. There was a purple, purplish light that came from... Uh, openings around the dome of the craft around here. And so he just stayed there. He's making a sketch of the object and he's noticing um, the size is about 40, 35, 40 feet in diameter. That is about the size of the Tic Tac UFO. And it's about eight feet high, he thinks. So, um, and then this thing Same was- Same size as Westall, by the way, Australia. This, Oh, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I forgot to get into the I size know. of that object. So very good. This is an additional three feet high up here, this little dome part. So it's a decent size craft. You can get in there and, and move around. Uh, he smelled what he thought was like sulfur. He heard whirring of uh, 
like an, a fast electric motor and a hissing sound again with a hissing sound. Mm, interesting. So as if like air were being taken into it. And then he notices there's a hatch that's open and here's a drawing of the hatch right there. And he gets closer to this. He can, he can't see anything inside it at first because, um, he's just not close enough. And he sees beams of a purplish light inside there and he gets up to about 60 feet of the craft and he hears two voices and they sound human or human-like. Uh, one was higher pitched than the other one. And his assessment at this time is that this was an American test vehicle of some sort. So he gets closer to it and he says, okay, Yankee boys having trouble. That's his first <laughs> statement. He says, come on out and we'll see what we can do about it. And uh, he doesn't get any response. And then he tries a no. Russian. <laughs> you should have said a. Well, he speaks I'm in Russian, <laughs> Russian, German, Italian, French, and Ukrainian. Wow! Like, so he must not have been Polish. He had to have been Russian or Ukrainian. That's my mistake. So he's using all of these different languages, and the voices stop, and suddenly, panels slide over the opening and it seals it. He says like a camera shutter. The whole thing just became sealed off. And um, and he noticed that the walls of the craft had like a honeycombed look or something to what he described as a great pattern on it. And that's where he draws it right over here, as you can see. Okay. So after the hatch closes, he touched the craft. He had a glove on his hand and he touched it and it burned the fingertips of his glove. The craft tilted a little bit. It started spinning really fast. And he was standing near this exhaust area, this ge geometric pattern. And when the craft started moving, a blast from this opening came out and hit him right on the chest in the upper abdomen part, very hard. And uh, there's a picture of him. This is Stephen McCallick in a hospital bed or in bed and look at that pattern on his chest. That's not fake. This actually happened to him. You know, it's amazing that we have this picture. There's some other pictures as well. I'll show in just a minute. But uh, actually his undershirt uh, has the same pattern and it caught fire. And we have a picture of that. This is another image of him here in his hospital bed. He's obviously not feeling well. And, um, and there's an image of his undershirt. What was remaining, you can see it's burned. And here's a pattern, but there's McCulloch. Um So anyway, the, the shirt was on fire. He actually took the shirt off and uh, threw it to the ground he, and he stamped <laughs> out the fire. Excuse so anyway, <coughs> Excuse here's some water. Um, so he's got burns on his abdomen. He's feeling sick. Um, he was inhaling vapors from the machine and he believed that that might have caused it. And he looks up to see the craft leave after it uh, blasts at him. So both of the craft are gone and he feels a rush of air as it takes off. The craft turns different colors. It's orange. It's, uh, and then it actually, as it depart departs, in his uh, estimation, it went faster than any aircraft he'd ever seen. So it went off really, really fast. Um, and there's much more. He's smelling sulfur. He smells what seems like burned electrical circuits and so on. So he goes back to the landing site. He feels nauseous. He's got a headache. And he finally reaches the highway and he gets a Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, who's driving by. And the and this is what's surprising because Canada is a place where you think everyone's helpful and friendly. <laughs> not this RCMP would not help. So that's interesting. He tried to get help at the park headquarters. That failed. He goes back to his motel where he was staying. A few hours later, he takes a bus back to Winnipeg. He calls the Winnipeg Tribune for help. And he says, I don't want publicity, but I will tell you what happened to me. His son is there. His son takes him to a hospital where he gets medical attention and the burns on his abdomen were legit. They were diagnosed as superficial. So that means they didn't go deep into the body and they just took him home 
but for several days he had nausea, headaches, uh, lack of appetite. He lost something like 20 pounds in the next uh, few weeks, I believe. Uh, he saw a physician who said, uh, we're going to check you for radiation, but they never really found any effects of radiation. And again, here's uh, some pictures of McCallick, um, and his, and that's really all that we've mm. got of that whole thing. So McCallick, um, there was, uh, they went to look for radiation. They took him to a, a whole body radiation counter. It was called at an atomic power installation. And, this thing detects and measures gamma radiation from isotopes in the body. That's about all that I know about it. But anyway, there was no abnormal radiation count that they detected. Mm. So he lost about 22 pounds over the next week, but then regained his strength and regained some weight um, in the aftermath. And there doesn't seem to be any... Uh, long-lasting damaging effect that he experienced from it, but it knocked mm. him out. So that's to McCallick. Uh, that was investigated at the time by the Condon Committee, which was going at the time. Oh. And they kind of gave it an inconclusive response. They didn't, they didn't say that this was legit. Um, and they kind of implied that they didn't they think it was... they just didn't uh, hoax, you know, or something like that. Well, they didn't say explicit <laughs> hoax. Uh, they didn't go that far, but the investigator of that case didn't really give it a ringing endorsement. So I think he, hmm. he thought it might've been a hoax, but uh, the, I don't think there's anything that really points to a hoax in this case. Once again, you've got something. No, it's just that it was the Condon committee. I yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those are the four that we've got for, for this um, session. I think those are pretty good cases. They are good cases. I think so too. And uh, you know, it's interesting. They're all, uh, since we're just looking at, even though they're all over the place mm -hmm. <clears throat> geographically, uh, there are some similarities in the craft, for example. You know, the the craft reported in all of these cases were the smaller size. And actually, you've got mm -hmm. the Socorro and the Valensol craft are potentially identical. Mm -hmm. And you've got the Westall and the Michalik, the Falcon They're Lake similar. are very similar, <clears throat> not necessarily not identical. Yeah, but they um, even things uh, that you were saying about uh, this last one, the uh, Westall one was a low buzzing sound. Mm -hmm. There was heat coming off it. There were uh, lights on the bottom, you know, so it was smooth on the top. It was saucer shaped. Yeah. Uh, you know, yes. so th there are quite a few similarities. Yeah. It's now, interesting. you know, when we think of encounter mm -hmm. cases and nowadays. And silver colored. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. Uh, when you think of encounter cases with extraterrestrials, like these days, you think, oh, abduction. Mm -hmm. Where you think gray aliens, and you know now we only have sightings of two, of aliens in two, the first two of the cases, mm -hmm. but they're not quite like gray aliens. In they're they're similar. Mm -hmm. They're short, mm -hmm. large head, mm -hmm. bald. Uh, the Valensol case, I think you get a closer view yeah. of these creatures, and they're mm -hmm. obviously not human, but. Um, I don't know if they're exactly described as gray aliens either. They seem a little different to me. Um, it's hard to know. You know, all these years have gone by and mm -hmm. there's no photographs. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the description sounds human like, but definitely very different. Shorter, large heads. Right. Longer limbs. It does seem like <clears throat> in that case, those beings were perhaps actually genuinely interested in the, in the uh, crops or in the. Yeah, that's what it seems itself. like. It's like he's kind of in the way. Let's just paralyze him. Right. Get, and they apparently they continued on with what they were doing. Right. But it sounds to me like a lot of the details that he hid, you know, that he didn't want to disclose. Yeah. Are, uh, you know, potentially very interesting because he did imply in some of these things that he had other contact and that he right. had beautiful experiences. One thing I didn't say that that Robert had said was he described, uh, he didn't think they were negative, even though they had paralyzed him. Mm -hmm. He described them as um, having this goodness in their eyes. Okay. So that, you know, that, of course, we know that they can uh, manipulate us, but that that's just his report. Well, I guess I... Or I, I won't say we know anything. We don't know we, that that's... <clears throat> it appears they can manipulate us. 
that's that's true that's true but it's also i i'm just going to say this much on on the other side of it which is there are a lot of researchers going mm -hmm. all the way back serious researchers who have also formed the same opinion that these beings are actually good or at least they don't mm -hmm. mean us harm mm -hmm. and i would just say that you know there are reasons to think both of those uh, extremes like yeah. positive and the negative so mm -hmm. i definitely leave that open mm -hmm. one Wait. thing yeah. No, I was going to say you're right, though. It seemed like they're interested in, in the land. Yeah. One thing about all four of those cases, and this is really the case, I think, with all of these encounters, is that these beings did not want to be observed by us mm -hmm. in every, or at least it seems that way. That <clears> they, so Socorro, the beings didn't realize Lani Zamora was watching them at first. And when they did, they got in and just got out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Valensol case, it, we don't really know, but they didn't really want to, uh, they didn't seem to want to interact with him. Uh, the Westall case, I don't know what was going on there, but objects came and then they immediately departed mm -hmm. when a bunch of kids come running out. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being one of the beings inside the craft? Seriously, mm -hmm. if there were live beings in there, they come down, maybe there's a problem, maybe, I don't know what it was. And they just happen to land at this a field. This herd of children where, come. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's actually kind of interesting. It's almost funny. But not everything that happened in that case was funny. Right. And then the McCallick mm -hmm. case as well, like these beings, mm -hmm. maybe they weren't aware that he, they were being observed. And when they were, they immediately got out of there. So there's definitely this evasiveness and uh, lack of willingness to want to interact with uh, people. Now, that's not always reported cases. There are some interaction cases reported over the years where people will say, yes, these beings actually chatted with us. And uh, not all of those people are impossible to believe. I'll just say, like there's enough cases mm -hmm. reported over the mm -hmm. years where people have made these claims. And so that's part of it as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, but great. in these that we've looked at tonight, definitely evasive uh, attitude by these other beings. Agreed. You know, they're doing something and they didn't want to be observed. These were all 50 years ago, these cases, 50 mm -hmm. plus, it's amazing. And the one um, in France was, you know, we just did that show not too long ago on cases in France. Yes, indeed. And it still follows a bit of a pattern of what was going on in France. Right. Uh, with the wand paralyzing people right. while they go about their business. Yes, yes, <clears throat> absolutely. That was in the 50s. Well, I, I think there's many, many more things that we can say about uh, encounter cases and even these four, but we probably, said everything we're going to say tonight. Uh, I don't know if we want to take any member question or questions from the from, from the public the or okay. prepare, say hi to prepare to wrap it up. Hi, Jeff family. <laughs> Hope this has been interesting for folks. Um, I find these cases just endlessly fascinating. And I think as we go through the weeks, uh, I would like to do the same type of thing for the 1970s, mm -hmm. 1980s, 1990s, and in, well into the 21st century. There are definitely good contact cases in the 21st century and don't think we're not going to talk about them we are going to talk about them there's some very very high profile ones as well that i would like to um really examine so anything here <clears throat> from john miller when is tracy going to cover dialov pass the dialov pass incident uh when's that going to be done uh oh I am so into that. So don't think because we haven't brought it up that we're not going to eventually go into that. It's just that there's so much information. Um, well, what's <laughs> happened is, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you this was all new to you. Mm -hmm. And you've purchased several books <laughs> and you've been picking through them meticulously. <clears throat> um, we've been talking off on our own about this every so often. And mm -hmm. for our member side, at Richard Ola members, uh, if you are a member there, you can actually hear Tracy and I talk about the Outlaw Pass uh, in quite in some detail. And you have a lot of detail that mm -hmm. you have picked up about this case. I'm very impressed, and I love hearing mm -hmm. you get into a lot of the details. It's very complex. It is it's very, a very complex. complex case. Uh, you have a lot to say about. Yeah, it. there are so many things to consider. Um, but I, I get. May I just say, I sure. get the idea from you. Before you do anything in a public venue, you probably want to nail it down a little bit more to your I do. satisfaction. Oh yes, absolutely. So it's going to be a little while. I mean, if I could work on it full time, that would be amazing. Uh, but I try to squeeze it in every, every little bit of time that I have. And uh, there are so many things to sort through. I was saying to Richard, like, you know, the further I go, 
the more questions I have and I have to go back and, and reread mm -hmm. and learn who all of the people were, for example, in the search parties, in the criminal investigation. Just in case someone doesn't know, <clears throat> it's 1959, Soviet Union, Ural Mountain region, and one of the most horrific uh, and un unexplained mm -hmm. cases of the deaths of nine uh, very experienced hikers. Mm -hmm. uh, they should not have in died. In their early 20s. And yeah. the way that they died is just absolutely completely bizarre. and nothing really makes sense you know yeah. there's over 75 theories for it and uh, none of them really hold up 75 theories is incredible. yes they've reopened the case but they're only looking at uh natural theories yeah. such as avalanche and uh you know these types of things and uh but that upsets a lot of people because uh you can you can easily dismiss a lot of those things well, once you go through the uh, the uh case files we'll come back to that love again so but yes let's so move along it, we here. will we will do that we okay. were talking about encounters from the 60s but good question and we'll i'm sure we'll come back to it is there anything else in there that's uh Kentucky man mr dolan can you elaborate on the socorro symbol disinformation and the role of captain, captain holder, holder from white sands uh that's a good question uh white sands was right on the scene immediately to do an investigate to to arrive at the scene for the Socorro case. The symbol, I, I don't actually know what I can say about his role in this particular investigation. So I'm glad you asked it, and I definitely would be happy to follow up on that. The symbol has been debated and debated and debated by people, but the fact is Lonnie Zamora wrote it down. So it was his own drawing. And he said that it was on the side of the craft, so I don't really know what else you can say about it. So, next, Maurice Moss gave no info on symbol, as far as I know. He was interviewed by Alme Michel, yes, mm -hmm. right, and Jacques Vallée. Did they report any symbol, to your knowledge, not to mine? I didn't hear I that from I Robert that either. They did. Yeah. <clears throat> so, any others? Let's see. Uh, magne magnetism effects on watches. In the discussion, oh, this is a question relating to Chris DiPerno, uh, New York State's chief investigator for MUFON. I just interviewed him for uh, the Richard Dolan show. Had a mm. really good investigation. That was released last night. So this question concerns magnetism effects on watches. Uh, happened with the woman that saw the giant rabbit. <laughs> she That's had some right. troubles after the after contact. Yep, that's right. She also had the same thing where she couldn't wear a watch. It was either too fast, too slow, or it would stop. Yes, But exactly. she could no longer wear watches, so you're right. That I was actually is, thinking about that when oh I my uh, God, that case is absolutely out of control. Maurice Mass had the same problem. <clears throat> I actually said this was this was not on the YouTube video, uh, that case. Oh, the this giant was, rabbit. That, that was, was on members two. only. Sorry, guys. You are a member of Virginal but, Members. But you can look up the case. You can look up the case. Yes, that's right. It was in, um, where a, was that, New Mexico? It was in, no, Phoenix, no, no. Arizona. Oh, yeah, yeah, it Phoenix, was. Phoenix, Arizona. You can look it up, uh, this giant rabbit. I know it sounds it's crazy, insane. but um, it, as you said, it passed through Phoenix MUFON, Mufon and those guys are tough the, on cases. They are. So a woman um, is driving, She's and there's this huge rabbit which like man size i guess mm -hmm. scares scares her to death and i'm trying to remember what happened after that she just got out of there or it got out of there she or ran whatever. she ran away she ran away and her watch was messed up i said i would have run the thing over that's what you said i'd have I hit said, the gas no you wouldn't i think i might have because actually first of all i would think in my mind there's no such thing as a rabbit that big so, so you just want to hit it. So the, you're the one of the people is, that would take the gray aliens and stick them in a tube because you said you would want to scientifically. Uh, I'm embarrassed you're to one say of those probably, yes, I probably would be one of those guys. They should just bring me into the, the NSA or the Air Force and I'd put them in the test tube. And No, but seriously, <laughs> I would have. I you would not have, have run it over. No, because what if it's a guy in a rabbit suit? Then that's considered wrong now <laughs> to hit people with automobiles. When I was growing up, everyone did it. But now you can't do that anymore. So I probably would have with, withheld my instinct. <laughs> I'm just saying New York, Long Island, back in the 70s, we all did that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Car comes speeding down the road. You, your job is to get out of the way. That's the way we roll. Okay, back to... Uh, 
getting all serious now. Sorry. Reviving real news, just amazing the details, no matter how small you bring out and explain uh, so brilliantly, Mr. Dolan. Really appreciate you and your sincerity, your passion. Well, thanks. I, I, I appreciate that. I, but I actually want to go back and look over the, to the disinformation uh, claim over the Sakara case now because I think I missed that one. But I do appreciate it. Look, I, I love this phenomenon. And you know what it really is with me? I just, I love studying it. And like anyone else, I just throw myself into it and I just learn as much as I can. I don't learn everything. There's always things that I miss. But I'm I'm just, um, it's like I'm a fan who got really, really, really into it. And if I've never stopped, it's now been uh, almost well, more than 25 years and I've just never stopped. And uh, I like to, I like to share what I learn. And that's why we do what we do. Because like I get into it and I like to talk about it. Mm hmm and figure things out to what a limited extent that I can. There's another question here. Then we should probably wrap this up soon. We're almost uh, 90 minutes, right? Probably. Tim, do you think maybe the Zamora egg-shaped craft could be like the Tic Tac Nimitz craft? Well, we were talking about that. And, you know, I mean, the shapes are mm -hmm. roughly similar. You've got this sleek, sort of very streamlined look for both of them. Uh, for the two cases. Yeah, for the for the Socorro and for the Valensol case. And then fast forward 40 years and you got the Nimitz case with the tic-tac-shaped UFO. Um, it is described as a bit different. It's not exactly the same, but, um, and it's also described as larger the than, than, than the Socorro and the Valensol craft. It's about the same what size What is it, what is it as estimated the as? The Valensol craft? No, no, the um, Socorro tic -tac. craft. Oh, the tic-tac about 40 feet long. Okay. So it's a decent size. Yeah. You know, it's a decent size. You, you, a, a grown adult could easily get in there and manage it. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, but the they're size still, a, they're really not that big. So, no, but it's, uh, it's a reasonably decent size. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm always, I'm one. always getting ready to wrap it up here. Last one. Here we go. This is Tim who says, I was hoping you would mention this case. Not sure which case he means. Uh, so whichever one, one of the four. Gratitude and appreciation for all you do in the future. Your take on Edwin Four encounter from September 74 from Langenberg. Uh, several hundred kilometers from this event. Okay. I'll look into that. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll look into that. There were a lot of good encounters in Europe in 1974. Uh, Spain is the most noteworthy from my perception, but we'll look into some of these other ones and, uh, maybe when we do the seventies, we'll, we'll get into that one. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Uh, Jennifer just said, can you do a conference closer to home in New York so we can come to see you and afford it? Well, if you're ever in Rochester, we, are we, there's a Rochester UFO meetup and we're there almost every month. And that's a very casual, fun event. Uh, let me just say, yes, uh, I'm I'm a big fan of the Rochester UFO meetup. We, you're, you're now a big fan. Mm -hmm. We've been going together, but that group's been going since 2008, run by my buddy Cookie Stringfellow. There's a shout out to Cookie. She's been running it all these years. We've got uh, one of the most dedicated groups of people you'll find anywhere uh, relating to UFOs, and we meet once a month. And yeah. uh, it's on the web. You can look up Rochester UFO meetup if you're in the area. Go check it out. We'll have 30, 40, 50 people attend. We'll have, when we have lots of guest speakers, we'll have as many as 80, 90. Uh, we had Paul Hellier speak for us, and we got uh, about 90 people for that. I give lots of impromptu lectures for it all the time. Uh, we have uh, lots of members will give presentations. Mm -hmm. We've Even when there aren't presentations, though, it's always really interesting because people will come out of the woodwork and tell these incredible stories. Absolutely. We, ha we had that happen in the last one. We do indeed. So mm -hmm. if you want to come to the area. If you're in downtown drive, New York, it's a bit of a drive. It's about six hours away. From so, New York City. From New York right. City. But we've had we've had lots of guests over the years, and we've had lots of guest speakers. We've had uh, Linda Moulton Howe. We've had Stanton Friedman. We've had Nick Pope. We've had Nick Redfern. We've had, uh, oh, my God. I Travis. Travis Kathleen. Walton. Kathleen. Kathleen Martin. Some are in person, some are by Skype, but many are in person. We had George Norrie twice <laughs> come in on Skype or a phone. 
who, who gets to interview George Norrie? I know. We do. That's who. <laughs> so Rochester UFO meetup, it's the best game in town. And in fact, I would say that the folks who attend those meetings are second to none in uh, knowledge, sophistication mm -hmm. of the phenomenon. They can go head to head with any group out there. That's right. So, all right. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, I think this has been really good. I've, I think this was a good uh, program tonight. Mm -hmm. I think we covered four really good cases. There's always more to get into, but of I think yeah, we can't we can't bring everything up. But I think anything people need to understand is that this phenomenon goes back many many years, and it hasn't stopped. And some mm -hmm. of those cases that took place almost a lifetime ago are, you know, this wasn't ancient times though. They had modern technology. They were intelligent people. They were scientific in their perceptions. These people and, are still around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The West Westall people are yeah. still around. And, and they've um, done interviews as recent as, you know, uh, 2016. Yeah. Right. So, and perhaps since then. I mean, Maurice Moss is gone. Um, and Lonnie Zamora is gone. They lived both a long, long time. They had lots of interviews after the fact. And um, Stephen McKellick, I'm not sure. I don't think he... He uh, was particularly active after this, but but and Maurice is, Moss. I just want to say, yeah. uh, Robert Fleischer was talking about doing a documentary on that case. Right. I think it was going to be in French, though, but and oh. eventually in English. But uh, so that's something yeah. that we could look forward to. Absolutely. So, well, maybe we'll look at the seventies. Yeah. We, we, you know, and I'll revisit. I'll get some uh, sideburns happening. Maybe a bit of a kind of a like a fro type of action happening with uh, bell bottoms. We'll just see. Oh, and uh, I want to wear the beads. It wasn't too long ago we were wearing bell bottoms. Beads and like the stringy things. What were those? Like I'd like the, to see this. You know what that is? Sure. The string things? I don't know what you're talking Fra about right now. The frayed uh, outfits. Oh, I see tassels. Oh, and uh, like Elton John glasses, like with the kind of uh, tinted. We'll hold you to that. We'll hold yeah. you to that. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so Richard just released on YouTube last night for the latest Richard Dolan show, uh, Chris DiPerno, who he was saying is the chief investigator for MUFON in New York. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely uh, a great one to check out. Totally agree. DiPerno is uh, very impressive. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that was his first interview. Mm -hmm. And he did a really great job. Um, but but think, he's shaking things up there at MUFON. Yeah, I think it really uh, gives people some insight into what's going on with MUFON and, you know, what, what, uh, people can do to make a difference like Chris. He really wants to change things and uh, he's got a new program going on He's holding town halls uh, I know there's one coming up at Pine Bush and He's setting up with investigators to be able to take people's stories uh, right. To take their accounts. He has an active group in Syracuse where he yeah. lives where they've got like I think they get 30 plus attendees now every uh, I think every month but one of the comments in that uh, YouTube thing that we put up was by someone who says, well, I don't really trust MUFON. And I'm like, listen, first of all, listen to the interview because it's very obvious that Chris DiPerno is an ex-cop. He's a very mm -hmm. experienced investigator. He's obviously taking the subject seriously. Yes, he's very dedicated. And he's, doing, he's doing a great job with doing fresh investigations on current cases in New York State. And mm -hmm. these are... Some of these cases are very, very interesting indeed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I and think it's not just sightings in the sky in case people think that. Uh, it's close encounters as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so. And triangles dropping things into our lakes. And who knows what else is going on. Yeah, so it's a very interesting interview if you yeah. haven't checked it out. Strongly recommend it. And as always, we usually remind people that we do have a free newsletter that we put out every week. Usually Sundays, sometimes Mondays. And that uh, lets you know everything that we're releasing to the public every week. And you can also get a preview of what's being released to the members. We have upcoming events in there. And just going to say this, just in case, because some people have been asking and saying, you know, I haven't seen my newsletter. We can't control this, but it ends up in junk mail sometimes. So have a look in there. Uh, that's just, just the way it is. So One person actually wrote to us and said, please take your newsletter out of my junk filter. Like, what and you, put it in the like, primary box. What well, do you think we well, do? people don't understand how <laughs> yeah, we, like, we don't want it in the how, junk folder. How do we control that? We don't want it in the junk folder. We control that. But no, we don't because uh, we would give it higher priority. But 
But uh, just wanted to say that if you do sign up and you think you're not getting it, it is very reliable system, but sometimes it does end yeah. up in junk mail. So, and yeah. uh, and uh, I guess we can say the newsletter is not the same thing as being a member at Richard Allen Members. Right. Like, newsletter is free. You get the newsletter, it goes in your mailbox, and there's a lot of information there. So that's all good, but it's not the same as being a member at Richard Allen Members. That's a monthly fee. Of course it is. That's it's a member site. You've got to expect that. So you pay a monthly fee or an annual fee, and we have a lot of material and content we're putting out every week. Yeah, that side and I well. just want to be clear. Uh, Richard works hard to put out a lot more than ever free content than he's ever done. So, uh, you know, we're not leaving out the people who don't want to do that. That's absolutely fine if you don't want to be a member. That's why we do but, this show. That's right. But there is additional content that you can get there. And the newsletter can, well, you can have a look around and see what that looks like. Yeah. But um, other than that, we just- Join the team. Become a member. Go to richardolemembers.com. You won't regret it. That's what I'm saying. But you don't need to. There's lots of free content too. But let's just take My this opportunity. Polite Canadian wife. That's well, I know. I mean, you know, not everyone can afford that. And you don't have to be there. There's lots of good public content that you're putting out. So right. fair enough. Right. So. So thank you so much to everyone for being here. Uh, people who are here live, people who are watching this after, just being here supports Richard's research. Subscribing to the YouTube channel is free, and that's a great way to support Richard's research and get you into the big league discussions. Time to smash the like button. <laughs> Richard just learned this. about the how everyone talks about smashing smash. the like button. <clears throat> He'd never heard this before. I was telling him chat chat talks about that. So, yes, absolutely. So <laughs> subscribers uh, also count in the YouTube game, and it would be nice to get to 100,000 subscribers. We're getting there, but uh, the faster, the better. And I would definitely love to see that. And without a doubt, whether we get to 100,000 soon or not, the fact is I'm very grateful for everyone's support. Yeah. And I'm grateful for you coming out here and um, watching this live stream. Doing a live stream is not the same as doing a pre-record, by the way. Right. Like, this is like showtime. This is not a... Like we have to really whatever we say stays here. <laughs> that's the thing, and it's you know how I am in private. Tracy's always worried I'm going to say the wrong thing in public <laughs> that I can't retract. So far, I haven't done too badly on most of these live streams. That's right. Now, when we go shopping, that's a whole different. The grocery thing. store is a whole that's different a whole story. story. <laughs> so fortunately, no one follows us yet when we go to the grocery <laughs> store. But that's a whole that's another conversation yes for another time yes it is all right so everyone thank you very much for being out here i'm richard olin and my wife tracy thanks Garbett everyone. dolan that's right and we'll catch you next time i do my saturday live stream alone uh those are much shorter uh but i'll be doing that this saturday and who knows what else we'll be doing but and that is also live and if you have notifications turned on you should get a notification of right. when richard is going live all right so that's it. Hope All everyone right. has a good one. Until next time, uh, let's fight the good fight. See you, see you later. Bye. Have a great night, everyone.